Dana, are you going to put a proposal in the film and media? Yeah, okay. actually. So I am. So our project, I'm going to split it between a couple different proposals. I actually think 150,000 for the film and um, media and creative challenge is like super small because there's going to be so many creatives who are going to see that and be like, yeah, I'm going to go submit to that challenge. And there, it's going to be like, you know, everyone's going to be fighting for the small bone type of thing. Um, so actually, I think, yes, we are going to, we are going to propose in that challenge, but I'm breaking up the project a little bit. And I am proposing a huge chunk into the cross chain challenge, because our NFT project has morphed into something that is going to be a cross chain drop between five to 10 chains. And I've already got like members from all these other chains. Plus we have our artists coming from another chain um, who's gonna be doing some design work and some advisors from other chains that are, I'm really pleased to see the sentiment around cross chain relationships uh, be more friendly in the last few weeks as I'm maneuvering around Twitter spaces. And before I was kind of like scared to bring it up or I think I've said, I said something, you know, a while ago. And as soon as you say that, they're like, ooh, spicy, Dana, spicy. You're talking about like other chains in our space or I'd go into an agnostic space or a Bitcoin space and I see people beating each other up and I'm like, oh man. But now I'm really excited that I've kind of, I'm more courageous about it and it's being very well received in the and in, in the agnostic spaces in our spaces so um and we're a little bit our our plan is a little bit tighter this time so we have um a project manager in addition to these cross chain I mean it's just gonna it's gonna be amazing and then I was messaging Juliana too during the during the town hall um I think we're also going to do something for onboarding because that's a lot of what our film is about is helping to provide tools and resources, not only for the main focuses of our film, which is mental health and veterans and, but the crypto side of it, we want to be able to give resources, you know, at the end and our project manager is helping us with, um, how do you open a wallet? You know what I mean? Like for people who have never been in, in crypto before, maybe because there's, there's ways to do to buy things with fiat and then you know you get a wallet that's like with specific instructions and all this stuff but it's we don't know how we're going to do it yet but there's something about putting tools in there to help people understand how to use crypto in the real world and um get on boarded so we're excited i'm excited and i think i mean i don't know it's because we were going to talk about spos later today I think that there's also like scaling up Cardano community hubs that could also be something for SBOs. And I think that there's like legs to some of this stuff. I, I think there's a lot of opportunities within all these challenges to kind of get stuff funded. So those are my two cents. Hi, Nori. Cool. And then, yeah, and then also, yeah, just the last comment I'll say on that is like, anytime you do something cross chain, like, especially if something gets funded from Catalyst, like everybody on these other chains is going to be aware that Cardano helped fund a lot of this stuff and it helps bring visibility to our chain and people aware of what the best practices are on our chain. And like, just the conversation I've been having, people are like floored about it. So yeah. That's my two cents on that. Okay, Julia, I'll let you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so I, uh, because we have a topic uh, for today and um, Dana will be leading the room um, and, and we also have a little agenda that we will share with you. Um, I just want to plug Natalie here because I guess she will be jumping at some point and to um, intro, uh, was it, uh, <laughs> uh, you wanted to share something? You messaged me about sharing something or am I wrong? No, that was just on, on the project section. If we're going to, if we're going to open up space for people to share their projects, so we can, I can jump in at, at that point if it suits. Oh. 
Uh, Dana, to you. Me? Uh, yes. Oh, to you so, too. so I guess like the format for these rooms is going to be like per Natalie's direction last week was like the beginning part is like sharing projects and we go into the topic and then so that's kind of the agenda then like free flow discussion so yeah we've kind of been talking about projects so natalie i'd love to hear what you have going on okay cool um so so we're juliana and i are working on we've been working on a um a project for the last year and a half which is called one up one down and um what we do at One Out One Down is make near peer mentor matches for women in business and tech. So we match um, women with a mentor who is just a couple of steps ahead in specific areas of learning development. And then we also encourage people to be mentors and mentees. Um, and we do this so that the knowledge the knowledge gap is small. And so that like what we've experienced coming into Cardano, people that have been in the, been in the ecosystem for a long time, they know so much and um, sometimes you know, the best matches are people who have just been through the experience that you're trying to go through. So people who have, who have just joined the ecosystem fairly recently and have done all the work to understand where to go and um, find their feet. So we, we, we've been doing that um, for women in business and tech in specific areas of learning and development. And our, our, um, what we're wanting to do is create a pool within Cardano so that we can use it to match women within Cardano already with mentors and mentees, but then also use it as a way to bridge the gap between the, the community that we have of women in business, bridge that gap to bring them into Cardano, um, because we have women who are wanting to learn more about um, how they can use tech to solve problems like sustainability problems, how they can get more involved in blockchain technology. So there's a real demand there. Um, so we see it as a really effective way for bringing people into the community. And so we we weren't successful in the proposal for fund um, seven, so we're looking to we're looking to make another proposal um, in the upcoming fund. We're just figuring out how to best approach it. But and and the proposal is to to create that pool of mentors and mentees. So we're really um, I guess the ask is if there are women that are interested in mentoring, um, either women within the community or mentoring women into the community. We'd love, love to hear from you. And I think we'll probably start by building out a list of who those women are. And the next step will be to try and get funded to create the pool to be able to use our software to manage those matches. So that's our that's, project. That's awesome. I One of the things, what was the title of your proposal from last time? Do you remember? Uh, it was, yeah, it was Bringing More Women to Cardano. Oh, that it was? was the, was the name of the title? Okay. Because yeah. I thought it was, I, I remember when I saw it, I thought it had one up, one down in it. And, and I didn't know what it was until I actually clicked on it. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, we did mention one up, one down. And we, we actually, um, we, I think we, yeah, we went through a bit of a process to try and when we were creating the proposal, like every, everyone does. And we sort of realized like, you know, that, that the big problem that we're really trying to solve is increasing the participation of women within Cardano, but also the number of, you know, the, the, the lack of representation of women within Cardano. So we, we framed our proposal in that way. Um, and I think that we, we got downvoted qu quite a bit. So that, I don't know whether that reflected the focus on it being about women. Um, so that's what we're trying to get feedback on now to, to work out what our strategy will be for the next fund. But really we, yes, yeah, so our, our process is we have really specific matches for short periods of time. So it's just three months, four meetings and the, we have software that supports that. And, and it's actually a really awesome application for DAO, which is what our long-term vision is. So um, yeah, there's really like an infrastructure piece behind it. And then the, the whole mission being about supporting women within the community. Cool, I love it. Um, not that I'm saying I want to stress myself any thinner than I already have, but I'd love to sit in on one of those meetings and help to just brainstorm some ways if you guys are open to it. Like I don't have yeah. any right off the top of my head, but kind of like helping to spin it in a way that is, I don't know, more palatable for, for Catalyst or how do you, you know what I mean, the angle, looking at the angle and then also yeah. understanding the root of the problem, you know what I mean, of the down votes and stuff, kind of going through that. But um. Yeah. One of the things that was really cool yesterday, and I told Juliana about this through um, DMs uh, yesterday or through email, I met, I met a high school female on Twitter yesterday. 
she was popping into just random spaces. She's only been on Twitter for four days. She gets up and she's like, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. And I'd like to, I'd like to share a little bit about my project. I'm a developer. And um, I think it was, I'm not sure. I wasn't in a Cardano space. I was in an ag agnostic space. This girl spoke so intelligently about the projects that she's a part of. And it has to do with mentoring. She's trying to bring mentorship to high school students in tech. And um, she has a whole, it's called Smarkle. The website is, I mean, she's already, she's linking NFTs to mentorship. And I was like, dude, you need to submit a catalyst proposal. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I sent her the link and I thought she was just, I thought she was going to jump in here today, but we're going to set up a, an, um, a conversation offline as well, because that not only was so shocking to me, how impressive she was verbally, but that her pro and not even 18 years old, this girl is just jumping into spaces. So a couple things popped into my mind when her existence was made aware to me. One, how, how do we, what is the, how do we help young people navigate, you know, open spaces uh, to be integrated into this community that is still safe? because the, the host of that room was the male and he was, he didn't mean it, I don't think, but as he was talking about her, he was just like, so you're under 18 and you're this and you're, you know what I mean? Like kind of honing in on, on, on like personal parts of her identity that I'm like, hmm, you know, there needs to be training in our community about how, you know, when that stuff, do we say something or just like, oh, yeah, we love the project, we wanna know more, we need to, make sure that if it's a person that we know is younger, we need to stay away from too much personal information right away. But, uh, and then the other thing was, I mean, connecting her with you guys because she's a female, she is a person of color and she, I mean, the project's amazing. I sent, I sent DZ all the links, um, but links yeah. are in the chat actually sort of, I saw her projects and, uh, totally blow my mind it she's 50 she's a kid and it the work that the person that he's she uh, she's working as fantastic i very very impressed mm -hmm. yeah with ML. And so it's stuff it's stuff impressive. like that and and that's not only maybe because what what you what challenge did you submit into last time you were submitted into not natalie Um, okay, mentors and accelerators. Oh, mentors and accelerators. Okay. So we'll probably do onboarding again. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it's a huge opportunity. Go ahead. I, I was just going to make a, or a comment or question really about the downvoting. I, I, I love this community and I'm very troubled by people's need to downvote proposals like Natalie's, if, if that's what I heard you say. And Nori, I wondered if you wanted to comment on that too, because I think the boosting diversity challenge also faced a similar battle. I, I don't know why people feel so threatened and what we can do about it. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit yesterday at the Leadership Academy meeting. Um, oh, if you look, sorry. look at the results and just find every gender, social impact, any kind of challenge in that space, they were the most heavily downvoted things in Fund 7. Um, Climate change, the challenge was the top one. That one got a lot of hate um, and other climate ones did, but all the women in Cardano that boosting diversity and catalyst and anything gender or social impact related were pretty heavily downloaded with like 50, 60 million downvotes, um, which is crazy. I don't know where that's coming from. So yeah. And then other things that were almost like Trojan horse disguised, like the Leadership Academy got a whole bunch of upvotes and got funded. Um, but I'm sure if we had dropped in any kind of gender diversity or um, anything around that into there, it would have gotten downvoted too. So I don't know how to deal with that, if it's education or if we need more upvoting whale um, sponsors or partners, because we know a few that are interested in these topics like the Cardano Foundation and IOG are 
always talking about impact initiatives and things and can we get their help um, to upvote, but yeah. Or the other way is just to, somebody mentioned Trojan horse, disguise in a way that doesn't trigger people to downvote and then leave it open enough that we can be including all of these diversity and um, different kinds of initiatives inside of it. But it is sad that we don't have a natural home for any of these initiatives now. We have to compete against dApps and open source projects and all that. So it's something I'd love to figure out a strategy for. I actually, I, I actually think, I don't know if the downvoting is really needed, first of all. Second of all, because for me, I don't know if it's an emotional thing so much it is as it is a strategy thing. It's like interviewing for a job. Just because somebody didn't get the job doesn't mean they're not good at it or, or the, the company didn't like them. Maybe there was just somebody that they chose to who they thought, you know, would serve the, you know what I mean, do a better job or something like that. So I think it's, although like diversity and it seems like those topics, well, it seems like nobody wants and, and the culture is not good. I, I I don't, I don't see it that way. I almost see it as, cause I, I took to a strategy in voting and in, in a lot of the challenges, even ones that I wasn't a part of, because you have to really keep track. There's only a certain amount of money. You have to keep track of how much money is accumulating as you're voting. Because if you push uh, yes for everyone, that's not doing anyone a, a service. Um, and if you push no for the people that you don't, that not necessarily you don't like their proposal, but in order to give the ones that you do like a better chance, like it's, <laughs> I mean, it's a strategy to downvote other ones. There's people who might not even have looked at those proposals they downvoted. Do you know what I mean? They're just doing it because they want to give the ones that they do like a better chance. Um, I, I, I don't know if the downvoting is, is something that should even be in there because it's just, it, it would make people pay more attention and do the work to understand how much money they're voting out there for each challenge. That's my two cents. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, from the first moment I understood that downvoting would be a part of catalyst voting, I, I didn't understand it and I don't like it. I don't, I, somehow it's so much more hurtful to be downvoted than just have people not vote for you. I, and I don't really understand why it's part of our voting process. Um, and as a complete aside, because I can't help dropping links in the chat here. It, Dana, you were mentioning trying to keep track of the voting of, of the votes within the challenge budget. If anyone hasn't um, used it, the voter tool that the AIM group has created is really helpful for organizing that because it, it'll track it for you. You can go in there and put various proposals in and it knows the budget for the challenge and it'll deduct it for you. Cool. That's the best thing I've seen since I started this process. I'm going to add it to my little cheat sheet thing. That's cool. I got to save this somewhere. Awesome. See Joe's hand up. Go ahead, Joe. God, I'm in my car, so I'm I'm <laughs> listening, and I've just pulled over. Um, I wanted to just uh, follow up on Alison on the down voting um, comment, um, thoughts. Why is it part of the, um, the catalyst system? Do you think, so I, I've been thinking about this a lot because immediately I um, I felt the same way. Like, why would you <laughs> make it obvious how hated the climate challenge <laughs> is, right? But actually, isn't that really useful data like it's it's better to like rather than um, having a challenge and it not get voted and it not get voted and it not get voted and not get voted and keep putting it up and you don't know how big the the dissent is against it. Do you know what I mean? Like we've got a really accurate count of how much of the total votes are you know not engaged in that kind of proposal. Um, so I'm starting to think. It was something just made me think about it that way. 
right? And I'm starting to think that actually it's it's really useful to have that data about um, who doesn't like what's happening. It's like we've got these these um, protests happening in in New Zealand right now, um, and it's and it's interesting because there's been a lot of dissent um, on social media, but you never know kind of where it's coming from. It could be coming from bots. It could be coming from overseas. It could be. But because these people who are in New Zealand are actually turning up in our capital, we can actually see for real the size of the, you know, um, you know, dissent against the current policy. It's like it's it's. I don't mean to minimize it either, but it is useful data, right? It's just just a thought I wanted to throw in. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Joe. I've never thought about it like that, but that's that's really, really good point from my perspective. Yeah, that is that is very interesting. Thank you for that. Hmm, interesting. I copied down the link. Um does anybody have any other comments or questions about proposals or the process um, before we get into the next segment, which is our special guest, Mermaida, talking about um, stakeholder operators and the relationship to Catalyst? No? Okay. Well, um, one of the things that we, I know, right, one of the things that we wanted to bring more education to and just to bring light to, and obviously this town hall's general session, going through all the different challenges, there's so many people that are, you know, wanting to learn more about their challenges, but um, for all of us who are here, who are supporting this room, um, me personally, and I know, I don't know how familiar the rest of you are with a stake pool operation and how it all works and how it's like basically the lifeblood of, of this whole uh, project catalyst. Um, I wanted to learn more. So we invited Mermaida to come speak. Um, she has a very robust uh, stake pool. And then also her and her husband have a white glove minting service on Cardano. And actually I learned, and they're amazing. I learned they were the first ones to create a minting service on Cardano, correct? Yes. And so they're kind of like, they're the OGs of, um, you know, getting stuff done in this ecosystem. So I'm so honored that she's here. And, and not only do they have all these businesses that they're running, but they have four children and they are just killing it. So even though I'm sure there's uh, obstacles and things that they've had to overcome, like I'm just so excited that she's here to share with us. So just to start off, Mermaida, just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, about your stake pool. And um, let's start for what, let's start there. So, okay, so in January of 2021, I was talking to my husband wanting to learn about crypto more because he had been in the market for a while and I wanted to find a way to kind of like blend my mermaid work and crypto, right? And so he pointed me in the direction of Cardano. And as I started like looking into it, I was like, this whole like stake pool aspect is really cool. Like I could teach mermaids about how it's not necessarily destroying our environment, but they can like also give back at the same time. So I've used it as kind of a, here's an introduction 101 to crypto and then stake with our stake pool and you guys can help us with coral restoration. So starting our stake pool, my husband, if he's, he's my IT guy. So when it comes to IT, technical questions, hardware, um, command line, all that stuff, like that's his department. And I'm kind of like the, the front end PR person who is the go-between between the public and the IT guy. Um, and then, okay, so February 26th is our state pool's birthday. So I think it's in like three days, um, which is really, really crazy. And then March 1st, I came home from work and he was like, hey, look at this thing I did on Cardano. Here's our first token. And he had minted Tails token. And so all of our stake pool delegators get to earn that for free. I, for free, we also have like a pay option and then a pay option for the public. And they are able to collect our Tails tokens and use them as additional discounts for minting services. So that is kind of the 
how and why our stake pool got started and then where the minting came in with it. That's amazing. And when Mermaida says her mermaids, she actually means mermaids. She um, she's a, a real mermaid that swims around and she has a tail and she has mermaids in training. And it's just a really cool thing that just I mean, different events, but also um, I mean, I love I love Renaissance festivals. So I love seeing that stuff. And um, I know here in Vegas, there's some mermaids here. So that's really cool. Uh, wait, 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 I need more details about this. <laughs> okay, yes, share about your mermaid journey. <laughs> so in 2017, I found my dream tail from my custom tail making company and I begged my husband to get me my tail for my birthday. And so I got my tail and then I found the hobbyist community and it was Michigan's big, really big. <laughs> there's, you know, there's two hands here. So we decided we needed to like break it up into smaller sub communities. So essentially what I do is I, in that aspect, I run the hobbyist community. We host swim meets across Michigan and beach cleanups throughout the Great Lakes region. And we teach new beamers how to test out monofins, pick their tail, put together their looks, keep their wig on underwater, how to apply makeup. Like I 101 mermaiding with them. And so um, that was kind of how I got started in like the mermaid industry. Then it rolled into my kids' teachers knew about it and educational events. And then Belle Isle picked up on us and they were like, we need you for our educational seminars and events. So we do plastics, educational events, that kind of stuff for them. Then it rolled into um, Michigan Renaissance Festival, reaching out and contacting me and asking if I would take over the grotto. And that essentially means from end of September to first week of October, I live on Michigan Renaissance Festival grounds. It's, it's pretty much a full-time job, um, but we love it. I would not trade it for anything. And then as of last night, I, I'll give you guys some like, I don't know, on the DL stuff. I was informed that I am now officially a traveling mermaid. I will be going to five different festivals across the U.S. this year. So all of that is being ironed out and my first stop is Norfolk, Virginia. Wow. That is amazing. Can you, can you share pictures? I want to see, I want to see um, a mermaid. I have no idea. So if you go to my Twitter page, you can totally see. I don't know if they'll show on my phone here. Which I just by the I way, just, I've been following you on Twitter for a really long time. So I was super excited to see you in this room so I can finally meet you. The you can link tree. <laughs> totally thank Dana. It's all like I am terrible about scheduling. So I thank her for like being like, woman, get over here. Um, let me see here. Yeah, and this room is being recorded. So there's a lot of people who go back and listen to these rooms. I've actually, it's been really interesting, Juliana, because I've had a number of people because they're so curious about what we're talking about in here in the women's room that they're actually going back and watching this space specifically. So there's gonna be, there's a lot, even though, you know, there might not be as many in this room as other rooms right now, there are people watching this stuff. So that won't show for me, but I will make sure I post a couple of new images up on Twitter. Cause I know people are like, what do you mean? So I'll add some as soon as I get back to the house. <laughs> and I know that she's being modest about her technical, um, her, her technical expertise, because even though she's a great front man, she also is very technically savvy when it comes to all this stuff. Like she was showing me I mean, I'm a newbie and I'm like, wait, what, how do you do all this? And she was just going through all the, all the platforms and all of the, I mean, it looked like she were doing coding to me. So yes. You so, I, so, yeah. so I do tend to kind of brush my technical skills under the rug. Um, I started coding in high school um, with back in MySpace days, um, there was a website called Furry Paws as well that um, my husband and I used as a, a base idea and built a horse breeding and raising and training game off of. And so um, Bootstrap, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, I'm pretty savvy with all of it. Um, image types, JPEGs, GIFs, you showed me a new one though, HEIC was brand new for me. So um, yes, I have some tech skills very much so. I 
think I probably tend to push them under the rug just because of the um, uh, the immediate kind of veering away that I experience from certain people. People hear that tech talk and it kind of scares them. So I try really hard to kind of, I hate saying it this way, dumb it down and put it into layman's terms for people. So I do tend to kind of brush off my tech skills. <laughs> well, I love that you shared them here. So can you share with everyone, how many people do you know, how many wallets do you have staked to your stake pool and how many people have or projects have you helped um, mint with your white glove service since it's been around? So for minting, we have approximately 300 projects under us that are active and currently minting in some way, shape or form, um, or they're in the midst of set one to set two. Um, how many delegators? I believe we were in the 250 to 275 range. Awesome, and what, so when somebody is going to choose a stake pool, what are the metrics that they need to look at? And what are yours that stick out um, in comparison to like a huge stake pool type of situation? So I am really big on acknowledging the kind of delegator that you are. There are different types of delegators. There are delegators who are here for their rewards. There are different delegators who are here for the mission. There are different delegators who are here to save money on their minting services, and that's it. It really depends on what they're looking for. And so I, I try to be pretty public about this, even when it comes to bringing my own family in. When, it, when you want a delegator to stick with a pool, you need to find what it is that gets their attention. I sent my grandmother to Lighthouse Stake Pool because they help bring clean water to remote villages over in Africa. She spent five years in Guyana helping bring healthcare and water and clean food to a village in Guyana. So for her, that's an, a very emotional connection. It was something that she really wanted to be involved in and be able to take part of, right? So for her, that was a great fit. Then on the other side, I have a cousin who he does, yeah, I love him, he's in his 20s, he just doesn't care much about the environment or villages, but he loves sneakers. So I was able to get him into the Cypher Kicks program and just started delegating to the Kicks pool. It, it really is about finding your delegator's goal with your pool and providing those um, values to them. When it comes to them searching through pools, I don't, I don't have a great answer for this. When you look at my pool and NAMI or Daedalus or Uroi, my pool ranks as having zero rewards and regularly says it's supposed to have zero blocks minted. I have CF delegation right now. I'm 25% saturated. My users are getting rewards every month and we generally mint around 17 blocks currently. Prior to that, we had just gotten over the 1.2 million delegation mark, and we were minting about one to three blocks every epoch. So there's like that huge difference in the amount that's staked with us because of CF, and so it jumps the blocks up. But by all means, we still should have been getting a good rating from the parameters that our delegators are seeing. So I don't have a good answer there. Yeah, can you go into a little bit what saturation means? So saturation is the amount of, of ADA that is delegated to your pool. So currently, I believe with um, CF, we have like 15 million delegated to us approximately. The max saturation is 64 million, I think that is. And that's where people talk about the, I think it's the K parameter or I want to, it's the K or the S parameter. They want to like adjust that. And so essentially K. that would... Thank you. <laughs> they would either like half or quarter that saturation amount. So if you if you half that, I would then suddenly be at 50% saturation. If you drop that to three fourths, I'm now saturated. And so it's meant to kind of push delegators out to other pools where they would saturate everyone. But it really is part of the struggle as an SPO. How do you, how do you fight that? We need to make blocks to keep everybody happy and feeling rewarded. But how do we also spread the delegation out like it needs to be? That's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about the cause, the, the coral reef and how much is being um, donated every month or, or what your program is for that? Oh, I see Allison's hand up, sorry. Um, Allison wants to ask a question. So go ahead, Allison. Well, question, but also another comment. Um, how many, what did you say the 
Cardano Foundation had donated to you? I'm doing uh, a I, I believe it was check. 14 or 15 million. I just know it was a, a whale wallet. <laughs> Re reason, reason I ask, you mentioned that Yoroi and Naomi don't have you ranked well. So I just started using CC Vault mm -hmm. and they've got you ranked as 442 and they're showing 15.69 million delegated and a return on stake of 4.37%. We've got a, they've got a generally good rating. So if you were to compare that to Daedalus, Daedalus says that I have no idea what the number is, but Daedalus tells them that they're getting zero rewards with me. So if you go to Cardano, Cardano and you read, I'm supposed to get Daedalus, she has CC Vault. So um, you, they're going to, you know, like Cardano by then default is going to essentially be saying my pool is giving you zero rewards. It's it's a weird backwards situation right now. And I think that's part of the SPO struggle is when we come to these very well-known wallets like Daedalus, it's not giving a great reading and it's not up to date on what those pools are putting out. Yeah, I was very curious because I just, I was searching for a new wallet and I just switched from Euroi to CC, CC Vault. So I was curious if you've used that one and what you thought of their So their CC rankings. Vault is the new one that we're recommending. And I would say oh, I spent good. a week playing with it. The only other one I recommend is NAMI. And that's just because users are more comfortable with that. Hmm. Thanks. Cool. No problem. Thanks. And um, now if you could just talk about the cause. A little bit. So we donate 50% of our block rewards every month. If we mint a block, I think it is, we get 340 rewards. And so half of that 170 is donated to Coral Restoration Foundation and Sea Shepherd, the US based organization, because there is like the UK. And so there's a couple of different ones that you can donate to. Um, Coral Restoration Foundation, we have been working fairly closely with them to get them to tokenize the different reef structures that they're working on. Um, they are kind of the driving foundation behind our coral, co our coastal pure NFT project. They I'm, I'm, I'm like super proud of these guys. They have downloaded their own CC vault wallet. They have started their own wallet. We actually get to start donating an ADA going forward this year with them. Um, but it all depends on the price of ADA. I think at the lowest end we've donated to them a month is 235 USD. And on the high end, I want to say it's like upwards of a thousand dollars to each foundation. Um, but if you check out our pool on ADA pools, it has a link to our donation spreadsheet and like individual donation posts. Cool. Awesome. Now I want to shift the conversation a little bit um, to have you explain a little bit of the SBO relationship to catalyst and to the Cardano ecosystem as a whole and what it means because I didn't really understand I thought that staking was just a reward for delegators I didn't know that it was like powering the system so can you explain how it does that and just share your thoughts on it so the rewards that pools are given each month is I'm told newly uh, send out ADA from the foundation and then transaction fees go back into that fund to continue the SPO rewards going forward. Um, I, this is techie and I don't understand most of it, but my understanding is that having all of the pools saturated helps spread that out so that it's decentralized and everyone's getting a piece of the cut. But beyond that, unfortunately, I'm not as technical as I would love to be. In terms of it funding card or Catalyst, I have no idea. I had no idea that it contributed back to that. So I would say that there's a bit of information um, gap between how we actually help affect there. My only knowledge is that we the 340 we get is directly from Cardano and new to the system. Okay, I don't know if Allison has a comment on this, but I do know somebody told me just recently that every time stake pool operators make a block, they're getting rewards, but everything that is made, some rewards are going back into the Catalyst Treasury. So all of the money that is being awarded out, funded to projects, every fund is coming from stake pool operators or uh, I see Darlington. Allison, is your hand up from last time or is it for a new question? 
Uh, no, not a question, but I was gonna jump in and, and add yeah. my perspective there if that's helpful. Yes, you and you and Darlington in in respective order. Go ahead. Sure. So, um, yeah, what the stake pools are doing is making blocks, and in every block is a transaction. So, if I send Dana Ada, it it requires a stake pool to basically make that happen, and the stake pool operators are playing a lottery for the chance to make the block and win the reward that they get for making that block. And the more delegators each stake pool has, the more lottery tickets they have. So that's why stake pool operators wanna get delegators because every ADA that's delegated gives them more lottery tickets up to a certain point. You can only have so many lottery tickets and that's the saturation point. And so then the reward that is paid to the stake pool operators, it comes from newly created ADA. So the, the Cardano blockchain has an algorithm that is actually minting new ADA. So you can think of that as like an NFT being minted or like gold being dug out of the earth for the first time. It's brand new, never been spent, created for the first time. That's one source. And then the other source is the transaction fees. So if I'm sending Dana ADA, I have to pay a transaction fee. So every block, the, the newly minted ADA plus all the transaction fees go into a pool. And the majority of that pool is given to the stake pool operator that won the lottery and creates the block, but they're not all of it. So there's a percentage of the rewards pool that goes directly to the catalyst treasury. And that's the money that is then distributed every fund. Do we know how much, what that percentage is? No, you know, I don't, I don't know if anyone else here does. I actually was looking for it because I was trying to find out exactly what the percentages and in, in the, I actually went, I, I went all the way back to looking at the academic papers that, that IOG published on this topic and they left it vague because that's one of the parameters that can be changed. So the process is coded into the Cardano blockchain and it won't change, but the percentage that's split between the treasury and stake pool operators can change. So I, I don't know what it is right at this moment. Maybe someone else does. Okay, cool. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, I don't I don't know the percentages either because my my understanding of Cardano is great until you get to the deep math part, then it kind of falls off the cliff quite fast. Um, but I will just slight slight clarification on the reward system. Um, it's very different than the whole per block. You did the thing. Here is some reward, like the way it works on Bitcoin or proof of work, right? As you're as you're doing your box and stuff, there is not an exchange of like compensation for for producing a block. You produce a block, great. You produce a block, great. You produce a block, great. Um, but all the fees are collected from every block, and all the transaction fees are collected and accumulated. At the end of the epoch, there is this massive calculation that happens um, that then goes through and, and does all of the allocation of funds, right? So it takes all the transaction fee. Um, some of it goes into the treasury that is for Catalyst. Um, and then the remaining, um, the system tries to, and this is really important to explain to delegators, the system looks at all the delegators and tries to give each person four to five percent um, return on that ADA over the course of a year, regardless of what pool you're in. As long as your pool is making a block, it tries to give you personally four to five percent. So what that means is if your pool is not minting a block every five days, maybe it's minting once a month, you will see that your ADA rewards are a little higher than somebody in a pool who's minting a block every five days because it's trying to give you 4.5%. So the new, the newly minted ADA comes into play when it's trying to meet that quota of every person that's receiving a reward that in that epoch is, is, is kind of aiming towards that 4.5 4 to 5.5% 5, 5 5 range. Um, so it looks at the fee. If the fee is not enough to satisfy that target, 
then it means ADA out of um, that 13 billion, I don't know how much it is now, to kind of to kind of prop up the pot that then goes to everybody. So it goes to voters, not voters, um, delegators, it goes to state pool operators um, and things of that nature. Um, but there's this whole like, the bigger the pot, the, 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 the more people there are in the pool, for example, the bigger the pot is for that specific pool for rewards to go all around. So it's not this whole you mean to block here is 10, 8 or something like that, which is really nice. It looks like the whole picture. Thank you. Just, just to add to that, Darlington, when you say, I mean, just to, um, yeah, to clarify a little bit, there, there isn't a person or an organization that's making those decisions epoch to epoch. So there's right, a- Ouroboros. Yeah, Ouroboros is the consensus algorithm, but there is, a, there is an algorithm that is coded into the blockchain that has determined how many new ADA will be minted every epoch. So we know the, the monetary policy for ADA. We know how many ADA will be created over the lifetime of the Cardano blockchain. And it's, it's kind of a complicated algorithm because there are more ADA that are minted at the beginning and it slowly decreases over time, but there, you know, there's a, a long period of time when ADA is going to be minted. So that, that's a known number every epoch. And then there's a very specific rewards mechanism where the they Cardano IOG researchers did a lot of deep mathematical work into game theory to set the rewards function such that the ideal outcome would be that every pool is earning roughly the four to 5% return on stake that Darlington mentioned. So one of the ways that that happens is, is exactly what Darlington said. If you have a huge number of delegators in your pool and your pool gets a big reward, that reward is gonna be split over a lot more people. So every person is gonna get less. If you only have a small number of delegators and you get a smaller reward, every person is gonna get more but the, the reward total is smaller to begin with. So it's the, it's the math in the original algorithm that determines how the rewards are apportioned that should lead to an outcome where the pools are all roughly earning four to 5%. But it, it does make a difference. If your pool only has a very, very small amount of stake, your odds of making a block and getting rewarded in the lottery are are less. So if you look on, on the, <laughs> the ones that are accurate in terms of showing the return on stake, I guess ADA pool, um, pool tool is probably a really good option. There, there is a big variation in the amount of, of return that the different pools are, are earning, but the rewards function that's coded into the whole process should lead to an optimal outcome where the pools are all earning roughly the same amount of reward for the delegators. The other big difference that's important to look at when choosing a pool, I think that was a question, is that the stake pool operator has the option of setting fees, which are how much money they're getting to cover their own costs. And so there could be a stake pool operator that takes 100% of the reward for their own fees. In that case, you could delegate to that pool, but you wouldn't earn anything. So that pool would, would be, be earning rewards, but their delegators might not be. And so there can be a variation in the fees that the stake pool operators are charging. Got it. That's really that that's really interesting. That that is really cool um, about the math behind how all this works. So you're saying that a small stake pool, maybe with very little delegators, I mean at the end of the year, even though they have a small stake and maybe they didn't make blocks all year long, they're still mathematically going to make four to four to five percent. The the algorithm is trying to do that for them. That's that's the goal. But we were we talked about the K parameter earlier on, and so I can't remember what K is now. Is it, is it two fifty? Maybe something. It's five hundred. Five hundred. So the K parameter is the number, and, and K can be adjusted right now by IOG. Someday with Voltaire, it'll be the community that decides that, but right now it's IOG that it decides the K parameter. 
So the K parameter is the optimal number of pools. So the rewards function is set for if, if there were exactly 500 pools and they were all fully saturated, which means that they had um, the optimal amount of ADA delegated to them, then every pool would be receiving 5% roughly. But we don't have 500 pools because not everybody is a completely rational actor. People are building pools for all kinds of different and wonderful reasons. And so there isn't a guarantee that every pool will make 5%. But the algorithm was designed to give the most optimal um, game, game using game theory, give an optimal outcome for, for the largest number of pools. Okay, cool. Right now, the, the pool does have to produce blocks though, right? So it has to produce more than, you know, one, one block in a year. Um, so it, it does, it, but it doesn't have to be every five days, right? So you can be producing a block every six to eight weeks or something like that. Um, and you, you will still be able to get towards that. Uh, four, okay. Four five right, five right now you need a minimum of about a million ADA delegated to consistently make blocks or on average, make a block every epoch. So if you're below that million ADA delegation, then the stake pool's not fully okay. returning the returns it could. Cool, thank you. Thank you for all this information. Getting back to Mermaida um, real quick, I just wanted to, since all the technical stuff has been very enlightening, I wanna get back to the human side of it a little bit too and just understand your journey and the process of creating it and what were your biggest obstacles and how long did it take you to make your first block? And what, what was that amount of ADA that you started out with um, to start your stake pool? Ooh, okay, so we started our stake pool with 2000 ADA. We used our Mint tool. Uh, so our Mint tool was out, I, I believe, April 1st, somewhere around there. Um, and the Mint tool has allowed us to raise our stake pledge up over 50,000 ADA. So that is all community efforts of the people wanting to figure out how to mint NFTs of their own accord. Um, so you'll often hear me say that we're a community built stake pool. I genuinely mean it between the people who stake with us and those who have used our tool that has made our pool what it is. Um, so uh, our first block, I want to say was last July. I think it was last July. So from February to July is like five months, I think it was um, for the first two months. So from February to end of April, I still worked at the pharmacy. And at the end of April, Fred was like, I cannot keep up with these mint jobs anymore. Like I need you to come home and help do this full time with me. Um, so I came home and we started working it together and it became a point of how do I help ease the transition for newbie minters to an actual mint job. And it's just been kind of a growth process with those people. How do we properly make all of this information easy to understand and not overwhelming for you guys? I mean, I know not everyone's a spreadsheet expert, so it's, you know, um, for our mission, it was something that was near and dear to my passion. And it's been hard finding the middle ground there. Um, as mentioned with the whole downvoting situation, and I hate saying this, most people don't wanna save the environment. They wanna line their pocketbooks. So it's really hard to get people to donate to a pool in which they're, you know, we might not always be making blocks. They're not all, well, I mean, until like two months ago, there wasn't really any token rewards and programs like that, but we put that all out this year. So, um, and that's, that's been kind of like the biggest fight that we've had. How do we draw people to our pool without it needing to be like, hey, let's just give away money, right? Uh, so there was like the whole, how do we figure out how they can self-claim their tokens? We've had to adapt to that so that we weren't, gosh, in the beginning, sending out Tails tokens to people, we would easily spend 150 ADA each epoch sending out Tails tokens to our delegators. So there was like having to fix, figure that cost into our rewards. And then on top of that, we're a 0% fee pool, pool, so we don't take anything from the rewards. So it's like, we're stuck within this little block trying to make it work that way. And so it's, yeah, in that respect, it's been incredibly frustrating just how do we 
incentivize and reward people who stake with us. Um, and then we still have those reward systems. And then Sunday token swap came out and we had, we had so many people leave for another token. And I was like, you guys, we, we make tokens. What's wrong with you? <laughs> like it was, it was such a weird frustration, but it comes back to that FOMO and how the, the value is equated with it for those end users. So do we have people who absolutely stayed and were like, I don't care about Sunday swap? Yes. But there was a large amount of people who were like, I need my Sunday swap token. So how to keep that loyalty has been like a whole other aspect of it. It's been really weird trying to find out what it is that makes people really stick with their pools. Um, yeah. So and then, you know, there's the whole woman aspect and that I could go on for a whole hour about. <laughs> Sorry, my unmute button wasn't working for a second. Thank you for sharing all of that. It's been so like enlightening to hear not only your journey, but it's just inspiring to see how successful that the pool's grown and all of that. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked or that you haven't shared already that you think is important for people to know about stake pool operators and um, just, the staking process in general? It's a business, plain and simple. I think a lot of folks think they're going to start this up and have a pool and it's gonna mint blocks for them and make a ton of money on the side. And it's something they can just kind of forget about and let go. And there's a lot of marketing and advertising that goes into it. There's a lot of customer service that goes into it. and. For my situation with minting, yes, that's a very hands-on job, but I also know for a variety of other pools who don't do minting and don't really offer those kinds of services, it's still a full-time hands-on job. Um, so I just caution to balance your time. That, that was my biggest issue when I first came in. Um, I threw myself into it. It got to a point where I was 24-7 on Twitter and answering calls and on the phone all day but you've got to have balance and there will get to be a burnout point if you're not careful and you need to make sure that you take that time for yourself and your own rest from it. And once we got those balanced schedules in place, it's really helped out my sanity level. <laughs> that That's that's awesome. Um, I had one more question, but it just left, but I see Alan's, Allison's hand up. No, sorry, that's a... That's a leftover. Sorry, I've talked enough. <laughs> oh, no. No, um, we love you, Mermaida. We thank you for being here and sharing so much of your time and your expertise with us. Uh, we're so, and uh, the, here's the thing that I, that just popped back in my head. I really think if you're still trying to figure out how to maneuver like the costs that it's costing you to do certain things, I think you should, I think you should submit a proposal into the um, onboarding challenge. No, I'm serious. I you, know you are. You onboard so much. And I'm not saying, you know, like if you need help or there's people who you've helped so many people, if you don't have the bandwidth to do it, I mean, this could be a simple thing. You have so many metrics, you know, your auditability is you have so much data, you know what I mean? This would be a shoe in I think, um, for people supporting, helping to, you know, um, helping you to make sure that you're able to still continue what you do and I, uh, get some catalyst money to do it. I appreciate the, the idea of where to go with it because I've definitely had an idea in the back of my head in which I just don't know which category to put it into. So I will type it up and give it to you later and we'll talk some more on it. Cause it is something where so many people come to me and ask me why I haven't done a, a catalyst proposal yet. And I just, it's one of those things where I needed just like my NFT project, I needed to have it finally lined out. So I knew the full scope of what I wanted to do with it. Yeah, onboarding and the scaling up community hubs, like no brainers to me. You, you do so much for the community. So people need to know. And people need to support it. And Catalyst does too. So I cool. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. I see uh, Session joined and Miroslav joined. Uh, 
we have been talking to Mermeda about stake pool operation and what it means to the Cardano ecosystem and to Catalyst and just learning um, a little bit more about what she has going on with her stake pool operation and her and her husband have a white glove uh, NFT minting service as well. They were the first um, they were the first minters uh, on the Cardano blockchain. They, they created the first minting service. And it was really interesting when you had told me that the other day, Mermeda, that when, you know, the big boys came on, they were actually coming to Mermeda saying, how can we work with you and offering her you know, different. And, and she was like, no, we already do all that. And so they're trying to, you know what I mean? Find a way how to make money off of her. And she was like, we already do everything, you know? So it's just like really cool to get that expertise behind. And I, and I love that you're female too, helping to pioneer that space. It was, it was an interesting conversation to say the least. Um, I'm always surprised by the number of people who I, I guess it's kind of that woman front. They think I'm not that techy. Um, and so when they're like, okay, well, we want to work this way with you and maybe you can put this layer of us in. And I'm like, but then I have to make my clients pay an extra fee to you on top of the fees they pay. I don't want to raise my clients' prices. And then they're like, oh, all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like my whole goal is to make this affordable to people in Brazil and South Africa. Like these are important regions that I need to make sure it's affordable to these folks. I don't want them paying an extra ADA that could pay for shoes or, you know, important things for the projects that they're doing. And it's such a premium service that you offer. Like I said, it's a white glove service and it's so cheap. I'm just, I mean, just the way you've helped to handhold so many people. It's like, wow we owe you so much but if anybody has any questions for mermaid we'll open it up for one last and we've been going for a while now um I, I didn't look at the time as to when this breakout started but uh we've been talking for a while getting some education but i'll open it up to the room for one last time and then if no one has questions uh juliana if you want to close this out but I just realized my hand was still up. I'm sorry. I, I'm hiding myself, you, because I can't stand looking at myself. Now, I, when I went to raise my hand, I actually realized it was still raised. I'm sorry. I do want to ask a quick question. Um, I'm curious, Mermaida, I, I give you a huge amount of credit. I, I looked into what it would take to run a stake pool, and I actually think the technical side is manageable. The PR and marketing and business side of it is a huge job, like you were saying. I'm, I'm curious, are you glad you did it? Yes, yes, 1000%. So I went from working 40 plus hours in a pharmacy day in and day out of the week. Um, and it was something that was truly driving me insane. I'm a bit more of a creative, <laughs> being a mermaid, probably pretty obvious, um, but being in a cubicle and like having to go into that day job, I worked in a giant warehouse where I was dealing with shipping and receiving and it just, the stress of that versus this, where I am able to showcase my passion, I'm able to let my creativity out. I mean, when I make a little graphic for our pool or, you know, whatever education purpose, like that's still something that is like a creative outlet for me. So to be able to have that, that outlet versus being stuck in the pharmacy, absolutely worth it. Um, and honestly, between the two businesses, they have complemented each other so well that I, I would not give it up for anything. I absolutely love being able to combine them. Darlington. I just had a quick question, but before my question, it's so nice to put a face to the voice. I've been in some of your Twitter spaces and um, and other things. And yeah, so this is nice. Um, uh, and if you've already answered this question, you can just tell me to go watch the recording and I will. Um, but what was your decision around um, setting your margin? How did you guys approach that? And you don't have to re-answer that. So I, I can watch. I watch a lot of the videos afterwards too, so. So I agree. I recognize your voice from also spaces and it's so nice to have a face with a voice. Um, 
our fee situation being that we were so focused on encouraging delegators to stay with us, um, it was just our way of staying on the course that we were and making sure that our delegators were getting the maximum amount of rewards. I was very shocked when we blatantly told people we weren't going to raise our fee that I had several reach out and go, that's not right. You need to raise your fee. And I was like, but that's not our goal. <laughs> so um, I absolutely understand the questioning behind that. But yeah, it was just, it made more sense to continue to give those rewards to our delegators who support us. And then just for the benefit of, of the recording too, um, even if you have a, a zero margin fee, you, you can charge more than 340 for the fixed fee. Um, and, and a lot of stick pool operators don't realize that they just, they just go with the default, but you can have a higher fixed fee and have a 0% if, if you know that fits into your, your server cost or whatever, and you're trying to meet a certain budget goal for your business. But thanks, thanks for, for, for being here. And thanks for the people who organized uh, this, this little shindig. Thank you for joining us and thank you for that information. I did not know that. <laughs> See, cattle at Catalyst after town hall sessions are already changing lives <laughs> in, the, in, in the women's breakout. Thank you, Darlington, for that, for that uh, comment. And thank you for being here. So um, if anybody has, and I see Nadia, thank you for joining us. Hope you had a good session over where, in the breakout that you were in. Um, we just got done talking about, talking to Mermaida about her journey being a stake pool operator and her giving us just some more education around that and how it affects the ecosystem. Um, stake pool operator and a mermaid. That to me is yes. the coolest yeah. <laughs> conversation. Yeah, very cool. You'll have to go back and listen to the, listen to the video. But um, so that's what we've been doing. And we talked about some of the proposals before we got um, into our stake pool operator rabbit hole. We talked about some of the, the female um, catalyst projects that are going to take place. And hopefully Mermaid is a part of that this fund. Um, but yeah, if you have anything to share before uh, Juliana closes us out, please do. I just love looking at all your faces and being here with you and hanging out and just, I'm going to watch this recording because I was super interested in this. And unfortunately I had to be somewhere else also. Not unfortunately, fortunately, there's so many wonderful options. Unfortunately we have to choose between them. So, um, but yeah, I can't wait to watch. And uh, then thanks you guys for putting it together. Cool. Thanks. All right, Juliana, take it away. Thank you very much, actually, everyone. Uh, so stay tuned because uh, we will continue with this uh, inviting, um, inspiring um, speakers. And some of our next, next guests are uh, Dr. Michaela Oleiro and Maria Carmo and other uh, stake pool operators that are female. So uh, be sure that you will be here next time. <laughs> and thank you, Dana, for uh, having such a great lead on, the, uh, on these sessions. Absolutely very enjoyed. Cool. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day and we hope to see you next week. <laughs> Bye. 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 Awesome. Thanks, room. everybody. Thanks, Juliana and Dana. Yes. Awesome. It's amazing. Bye. Bye. I'm going, I'm going to bed. So good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> good night. Good night. Yes, you are. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.